beautifully renovated four-bedroom house stands on the corner of Junction Mews, North Paddington. What marks this house out as different from the adjoining properties is a sign above a front window which reads Boatman's Institute. This building has had a very varied and interesting history. Originally two functional buildings, it has been a place of worship, a social centre, an arts gallery and even a builder's office and yard. Now a desirable luxury home, this house during the Victorian period was intended to serve Paddington's least respectable community, that of the canal boatmen and their families. In 1828, an organisation known as the Paddington Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge among canal boatmen and others, purchased a stable and coach house with a view to join the two buildings and create a chapel to hold around 200 people. This was to be an interdenominational place of worship intended for the boatmen who transported goods along the Grand Junction Canal and their families. The members of the society, a few pious individuals, intended the chapel to give religious instruction to these families whom they saw as not being properly looked after by the established church in the Paddington area. William Robin, writing in Paddington Past and Present, first published in 1853, praises this action as being very beneficial to the poor boatmen who needed the advantages which accrue from religious instruction and how little likely they were to get it in a parish church. But who were these poor boatmen? The Grand Union Canal links London and Birmingham and until the arrival of the railways this was the most efficient way of transporting goods between the cities. The faster flyboats, narrow boats which travelled constantly without mooring, transported perishable goods and anything that was required to be delivered relatively quickly, whilst the slower barges delivered heavier goods. There was also the necessary but unpleasant trade of the dust boats, which transported the city's waste, including human waste products, from Paddington Basin to the countryside for disposal. At the beginning of the 19th century, these boats were staffed almost exclusively by men. Although the work was hard and hours long, the wages compared favourably with factory work, so most boatmen could afford to provide accommodation for their families. On the Grand Junction Canal, many families still retained shore-based homes, even if they rarely lived in them. This accommodation was often rented from the canal company for whom they worked. It was probably a better standard and comparable accommodation housing rural labourers. Only a minority had no shore-based home to which they might return from time to time. Star Street in North Paddington was originally built to house the families of canal workers in 1820. Which poses the question, why could these families not worship in a parish church? Lack of space could have been a problem only a certain amount of seating in the churches was free to anyone to use, regardless of status. These families who could afford it would pay for their pews, meaning that large areas of the building were permanently reserved. This only left a limited supply of free places for those without money and social standing. Not being able to get into a church could be another reason, or a good excuse, not to attend, as well as a lack of suitable clothing. So it was concluded that both people could only be brought to God if special chapels were provided for them. On opening, the Boatman's Institute was popular. In 1829, 250 people were said to have attended Sunday school. The institution provided free seating throughout with no provision for payments for better or guaranteed seats. In fact, the seating was all quite basic until the improvements to the building in 1831 made the chapel more comfortable. A key source of information about the chapel in Junction News is the Paddington Canal Boatman's Magazine, first published in 1829 by the Paddington Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge among Boatmen and others. These magazines, copies of which are held in the British Library, were circulated to members of the society who paid at least two pounds a year subscription and distributed to canal workers who could read. The magazines detail which of the ladies and gentlemen had given donations, how much they'd given 
and for what purpose the donation was given. But there were other reasons why the canal workers should need their own chapel. Tenants fell off dramatically from the mid-1840s when more and more boatmen moved their families on board. The use of railways for transporting goods were taking trade away from the canals. Few men could afford to maintain a home and family on land as well as covering the expenses of a boat, not to mention the feeding and welfare of the horse who pulled the boat. The solution seemed to be that wives and children must live on board and share the work. It was around this time that the popular image of the itinerant families crowded into living spaces intended for one or two crewmen became a reality. And also when the most concern for their morals and religious observances began to be expressed in print and from the pulpit. The boatmen and their families were considered immoral, foul-mouthed, ignorant and desperately in need of salvation. At this time, the canal workers were considered more in need of missionary help than the rest of the Victorian working class. Certainly there was poverty, crime and demoralisation amongst factory workers, builders and other land-based members of the less respectable Victorians. So what led to the canal workers to be considered so inferior? One answer could be that no other job, no matter how long the hours or how poor the conditions, would require or even allow working on the Sabbath. To the canal workers, Sunday was a day like any other. In fact, Sundays were often the busiest day of the week for carrying trade. The cargo had to be delivered by a certain time, and if that meant the boat had to move on Sunday to meet the deadline, this had to be done. During the Victorian period, Sabbath breaking was considered a serious sin. The day should be spent attending church and on Bible study. Children were not even allowed to play. To see a child leading a horse down the towpath on a Sunday morning would have filled the middle classes with horror and concern for the child's soul. An article in the Manchester Times dated January the 10th, 1852 proclaimed A more fearfully demoralised class of men than canal boatmen could not be found in England. Gross wickedness characterises these men. To whose custom they were committed goods of all kinds and values, they were inveterate sheep stealers and poachers. A day of rest was unknown to them, except when a stoppage took place upon the canals for repairs. The committee who ran the Boatman's Institution in Junction Mews offered a range of services designed to encourage the canal families to join the chapel community. As well as offering free places for services, it also offered outdoor preaching, Sunday school for the children and tuition in reading for children and adults. The idea was that the chapel should provide spiritual support for the boatmen. The priority for the subscribers of the society were paying for the chapel, but also practical help and some relief from poverty and hardship. No matter how many members of the family were on board and working, only one wage was being paid per boat. The ladies of the society sewed clothes for the boat children so that they could attend chapel services and bread and cheese was occasionally distributed. Land dwellers believed that boatmen were supplementing their income through being increasingly involved in theft, poaching and violent crime. The chapel sought to prevent the dishonesty with preaching and practical help. But the issue remained. No matter how attractive the preachers and sponsors of the chapel tried to make Sunday attendance, boat workers would be penalised for not making the delivery on time. It seems obvious to the modern reader that the boatmen were not deliberately profaning the Sabbath as an act of rebellion, but acting out of necessity. The recipients of the cargo were more interested in getting their goods than in the moral welfare of those who delivered them. The response of the missionaries was to visit the boats and invite the families on board to stop and come to chapel. To some this might have been an attractive idea, to others a chronic waste of time. Either way it would take an act of parliament to regulate the working out of the canal workers and these acts were long in coming and difficult to enforce. In 1875 the Boatman's Institute was visited by the great philanthropist and social reformer George Smith of Colville who had passionately campaigned to improve the working lives of children in brickfields and factories. 
and later turned his attention to boating families. Smith had calculated that over 100,000 men, women and children were living and floating on our rivers and canals in a state of wretchedness, misery, immorality, cruelty and evil training that carries peril with it. His most concerning concern was 95% cannot read and write, 90% are drunkards and no more than 2% are members of a Christian church. During his visit to Paddington, George Smith was not impressed to find that the chapel Sunday school, although attended by 150 children that Sunday, contained only one or two children of boating families, despite there being 80 boats tied up in the parish of Paddington. It seems that the impressive attendance at the chapel was largely due to the other working class families who were keen to share the educational facilities offered to the canal workers. There was a great deal of interest in improving the education and moral welfare of Paddington's poor during the 19th century and organisations such as the London City Mission and the Ragged Schools Union were busy establishing schools and Bible classes around the Paddington Basin area. Whilst these charities provided basic education for children and some relief from hardship, the idea seemed to be not to give the recipients a roll out of poverty but to mend their morals, teach them to read the Bible and attend church, live a sober life, be content with their station in life. George Smith's campaign for better working conditions, free education and restrictions in child labour met great opposition in Parliament. It took until 1878 for Parliament to pass the Canal Boats Bill, which regulated some sanitary conditions on board the boats and required children to have some education but left enforcement up to the local authorities, which often meant nothing at all was done. It was the same year that the London City Mission began a ministry to boat people. An amendment to this bill was passed after three years' opposition in 1884, requiring local authorities to enforce the education of the boatman's children and to appoint inspectors for the boats, which are moored in their area. Meanwhile, the Boatman's Institute and the Ragged Schools continued their instruction in basic literacy, numeracy and religion, while those in Parliament debated the effect of bettering the poor on the profits of those in industry. Although the Boatman's Institution remained proudly independent till at least 1895 and regarded its chapel as interdenominational, we know that the chapel had formed links with the London City Mission. By 1897, the Boatman's Institution was running a band of hope mothers' meetings, a sickness and benefit club and a building society. It was very popular with local people, as George Smith commented it had become a finer place. But the canal families for which it was intended were not coming. The chapel had become the kind of respectable institution that was putting off the very people it had been built for in the first place. Information about the ownership and running of the Boatman's Institution between 1900 and 1925 is very sparse. A census of church going in the area, conducted by the Daily News between November 1902 and 1903, states that the chapel was being run by the London City Mission. However, Foster and Freer, writing in 2004, state that there is no evidence to show that this was the case. What we do know is that the chapel was becoming less important in the education of boating families' children. The various education acts, passed towards the end of the Victorian period, required children to attend school where their parents had to be moored, and as Foster and Freer tell us, the children were welcome at the ragged schools, if not at the more respectable local schools. During the beginning of the 20th century, the canal trade was declining rapidly, and provision for the welfare of the remaining itinerant families was more the concern of local governments and the mainstream churches rather than individual societies. In 1930, it was reported that the Boatman's Institution, with the aid of the Grand Union Canal Carrying Co, had established a floating school in an attempt to educate canal children while accommodating their family's traditions. This action is George Smith's recommendation of 1875 that education should be taken directly to the boating families. He said, suppose a boat or perhaps what would be better still a floating school 
was to call for the children every Sunday morning at nine o'clock, bring them home to dinner, call for them again at two o'clock, but to school they should go at whatever cost. An article in the Manchester Guardian, 30th September 1930, also reported that the London City Mission, with the cooperation of the Canal Company, had converted a warehouse in Paddington Basin into a sort of clubhouse with a chapel, a school, a workshop, a men's club, a kinema and a laundry where the barge women can wash clothes under better conditions than on the barges. So what happened to the Boatman's Institution on Junction Mews? The building ceased to be used as a provision for canal boat workers around 1925 and was acquired by various commercial enterprises, one of these being as an office in the 1930s for a financial company known as the Grand Junction Co. An electrician working for the firm Rhodes Brothers Builders in the late 1970s, early 1980s, recalls the building being used as a builder's yard with its office on the ground floor. He remembers seeing a plaque on one of the inside walls on the first floor where building materials and plants were stored, stating that the building was a chapel for boatmen. The plaque has since vanished. Rhodes Builders made use of the building from shortly after the Second World War, probably the early 1950s. The Grand Union Canal of today is used mainly for leisure rather than trade. And living on board a boat can be as expensive, if not more so, than living in a house with mooring fees and licences to consider. Paddington sees a great deal of weekend and holiday boaters in the canal, as well as the pleasure boats and water bus which operate in the Little Venice area. There are also restaurant boats moored opposite the canal side entrance to Paddington Station and a floating office permanently moored in Paddington Basin. It seems the most maligned or pitied pagan canal workers have given way to the respectable middle class boaters of the 21st century. One wonders today whether the canal families were in any more need of salvation than any other working class community in the 19th century. They were much demonised in literature and children were warned not to play with boaters children. Certain literacy levels were poor, even when provision had been made for the education of the children. A teacher would have had serious problems helping a child to progress when the child would only be able to attend for short periods before moving on again. Lack of space and washing facilities on board would have made personal hygiene difficult and survival in a half environment was probably seen as much more important than good manners and piety. It could be, however, that the crime of Sabbath breaking set the canal families apart from the land-based poor families. Many boat-dwelling families were tidy and well-mannered, but the missionaries on these families are quick to add that they are not typical. Of course there are exceptions. Occasionally this fearfully dark but true picture is illuminated by a few streaks of light, but they are like parish churches, few and far between. Whether the canal workers were misrepresented, or as uncouth and demoralised they were held to be, is something that can never be known for certain any more than we can tell if the ladies and gentlemen of the Paddington Society really understood the needs of their congregation or were concerned with imposing their own standards of respectability. All we have left to reflect on is a sign on the wall of a private house in an affluent muse, Boatman's Institution. My thanks to Ms Jill Foster for her help in research for this article and to the Boaters Christian Fellowship for putting us in touch. Also thanks to Mr Eddie O'Reilly, who saw the Boaters Institution plaque on Junction Muse.